Revelation chapter number 3. Preaching from Brother Hubbard's Bible again this morning, and uh, it's got a huge concordance in it. So I'm looking for revelation, and I keep having to turn and turn and turn. Of course, today is uh, September 11th, and uh, we, of course, have our our flag at half staff today, and we think about that, and we remember uh, what happened. Those of you that are probably 35 and older, we probably all remember exactly where we were at uh, when those things happened. I was in a car uh, on the way to a preacher's meeting, and uh, we got there and walked in. Somebody said, did you you hear about the plane flying in the World Trade Center? And I thought, is this like the start of a joke? Uh, I didn't know. It's hard to even picture that. And then we were in the middle of the preacher's meeting, and someone came in and said, uh, they've they've hit the other tower. And then we knew something was was going on, and it wasn't an accident. And uh, what a crazy time that was in our country. And um, it woke up some people for a short time. Um, Unfortunately, uh, that didn't seem to last for many people. And there was unity in our country for a time, uh, which again didn't seem to last uh, for some people. Um, Shortly after the tragedy there on September 11th, uh, President Bush spoke, you know, about the publicly about the terrorists, and he used the phrase. Uh, that I remember him saying, he said, you know, we will find these people dead or alive. And that phrase, dead or alive, kind of goes back to the Old West when a criminal was considered so evil that they said they have to be brought in. We don't care if you bring them in uh, dead or alive. And that works fine for terrorists and, and outlaws, but uh, that, isn't, that doesn't really work for churches. Um, we, we shouldn't be okay and just say, hey, we need a church dead or alive. Uh, the church needs to be alive. And here in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. I want to kind of focus on that verse today as... We move, you know, of course, September brings my mind to September 11th. It also, I mentioned earlier, we do this Sheffield Award each September. We try to do this, and the reason we do this in September is in September of 1974 is when uh, Pastor Sheffield came here uh, to um, begin the church, and uh, so he became the pastor. The church was meeting, but they weren't organized into a church, and um, about about September 20th in that range, I can't remember what, which date, it was that Sunday, um, is when he had his first Sunday as the pastor here at Calvary Road Baptist Church at the time. Uh, they became Grace Baptist Church, and he came here uh, those many years ago and, and started the church, and um, starting a church would terrify me. I don't even know, the Lord would definitely have to give me leading in that because I wouldn't even know uh, where to begin on some of those things, and uh, he came and he had a, about 20 people here when he first came and uh, maybe maybe a little bit less and uh, they began the church and God has blessed over the years and uh, we've been now, uh, this, this next year we will be celebrating our 48th year, or sorry, yeah the 48th year, Brother Sheffield came here 47 years ago in 1975, 74 was in December when they first had their first meeting um, over at the Henson's house, uh, but anyway in 75 he came. And so it's 47 years ago, and you know most churches that get started don't see their 10th anniversary. I don't know that most people really realize that, that, that many churches that get started never celebrate their 10th anniversary. And then I think of a friend of mine over at English Baptist Church, or English Baptist Temple, I don't know, but Brother uh, Amos Pranger, and he was telling me that in their churches, 60 61 years as a church, they've had 32 pastors. It's not often that a church would be 48 years, 47 years, and have had two pastors in the church. And I've always said that Pastor Sheffield saying here 32 years said a lot about him, but it also said a lot about you, the people of the church, and that, um, you know, that he would want to stay in that church for that long and, and serve. And um, you know, so I look at our church and I say, God has had his hand on our church. 
we're not a we're not a mega church. We're not uh, a church that, to be honest with you, let's let's acknowledge who we are. We're a church that half of New Albany doesn't even know exists. We're tucked away in the back of this uh, subdivision here, and we knock on people's doors. And even five minutes after we knock on their door, they weren't paying that much attention. They don't even know the name of our church. I I've, I shared with you one time that I was a, a week after I became pastor. I said, okay, I'm going to knock on all the doors in this neighborhood, and. I knocked on the door down here right before you get to those new apartments they built, and I knocked on this guy's door, and I said, hey, do you have a church home? And he said, yeah, I go down the road here at Calvary Road Baptist Church. And I was like, I've been going there since I was nine. I've never seen you one time in my life. Uh, But he drives by it every day, so he knew the name from the sign. And I said, and me being the the smart aleck that I am, I said, oh, they just got a new pastor. What's that guy's name? And uh, he said, if you hadn't asked me, I could have told you. It was, it, it's right on the tip of my tongue. And I thought, man, he's going to show up this week just to find out who the new pastor is so he can say that later on if somebody asks him. And I thought, this will be really funny when he walks in. And I'm like, hey, good to have you back. Uh, but he never showed up. Um, you know, God has blessed our church. There have been times um, I've not had to go through this as much, but I remember hearing stories from Brother Sheffield and uh, of those early days when you're getting started and you don't even know where are we going to meet at. Um, before they had this property and they had a settled home here, um, there were issues where they had to move around renting places and one place they got to, the, the crime in the area was really bad. And um, it just, you know, having to do all that, you're just waiting for God to give that direction, that discernment. I think the greatest uh, time in my ministry where we've really been like, I have no clue what we're going to do next it was March of 2020 uh, when COVID hit, and uh, we just thought, what in the world are we going to do? And, and God gave direction, and we moved on into some things. And, uh, but God has sustained our church over the years. And while I appreciate and I love Pastor Sheffield, and while I appreciate and I love you, the people of the church, God is what has kept the church alive. Um, God is what has let us continue to meet. But what has made it different than the churches that closed their doors? What is, what's made it different than the churches that many of you can look back to and say, I remember there used to be a church there, and now they're, they're gone. They're not, they're not there anymore. Should the Lord tarry his coming, will this church have that testimony? Will there be a generation after this that will say, I remember that Calvary Road Baptist Church. I mean, they used to be doing things for God, and then they died. And I hear people talk about churches sometimes dying, and I even hear people talk about their church that died, as if it's this far-off organism or organization that died, instead of realizing that we understand that the church is made not of wood and steel and concrete, but it's made up of people, people like you and me. So that puts a different spin on it. It means it isn't that distant organization that has died. It has to do with where we are are at spiritually. The church just doesn't suddenly fall apart. It's when we, the people of the church, die spiritually that our church will die spiritually. And this morning, I want us to be challenged from God's Word on what might cause us to be equated to the church at Sardis here that we might have a name like we are alive, but in reality we are dead. I mentioned Brother Hubbard passed away this week. And in every incident of somebody that I've known that's been, that has passed away, they are never pronounced dead right away. They always have to wait for the coroner to come in and, and they pronounce that they are dead. And churches are dead many times long before their last service. Long before they have shut the door for good and had the electricity turned off. When me and Pastor Sheffield had a talk one day about him deciding that it was his final year as, as the pastor, he told me, he said, and of course some of you know the situation that he had had some health issues even back then that kind of came back near the end there, but he had had some things and he said, I, for one, I don't want to get up there every week and just look weaker and weaker. He didn't know, for one, that it was going to go away for several years, but he said, I don't want to get up there and be weaker and weaker. And he said, and I'll never forget what he told me that day. He said, I've, I've been in this area enough, and I know enough situations about churches. He said, I've seen churches where it becomes a race to see who will die first, the church or the pastor. 
And he said, I don't want to hold on so long that that happens. And I praise the Lord that he got to be here to, to be a part of the ministry even after that. And he told me that day, he said, I'll, when I retire, I'll, I'll leave if you want me to leave. And I said, well, no, you're not allowed to leave. I just said, you know, we, we, can't, we, we can't lose you. Um, this is your church family. We don't, we don't want to lose you. You know, he said, I, I've seen churches be in a race with their pastor to die. And that hap- has happened many times. Brother Grass, you've seen that happen, right? Where it just, it, it's like as soon as that pastor dies, the church just declares, fine, let's just shut the door and be done with it then. So what, what could happen to us that could make us have a name like we're alive, have, have a service going on to where we think something is going on for the Lord, but yet we're dead? The answers will be a reflection not on a church, but on us, the church. The first thing I see from Scripture that could cause us to die is that we'd have no burden for others. Now listen, every member here would say that we care about the eternal souls of other people. We would all say and perhaps ease our consciences by the fact that we give you know, about sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year to worldwide missions. We're a mission-minded church. Over the years, I've heard two things said about our church many times, and in fact, I'm not picking on him at all, and I, I like that he said it. But Brother Curtis said today, I'm thankful we're in a mission-minded church. And some will say, and I'm thankful we're in a church that's a soul-winning church. I'll be honest with you, I don't describe our church as a soul winning church. I describe our church as a church with some soul winners. A soul winning church would mean all of us cared about the souls of others. And would be able to share the gospel with others. And not only would be able to, but would be willing to share the gospel with others. And we, like every church, we go through ebbs and flows where we care about getting the gospel message out there. It breaks my heart that sometimes we care more during election years than we do other years. i am be very honest with you. It breaks my heart that I see that sometimes. We care much more about proclaiming God's word during certain seasons of the year or certain years like election years instead of consistently striving to share the gospel with people who are dying and going to hell. The family asked me to mention at Brother Hubbard's funeral today what I told you the other day about that when, he, when the doctor told him, there's nothing else I can do for you, you're just going to go back to Azalea Hills and just bring hospice in and it'll happen. And the family kind of hung their head down, a little sad. And Brother, Hab- Brother Hubbard got as excited as he could be. He, said, he came home and he walked around Azalea Hills and just started telling. And they, they said he hadn't gone to the lunchroom in weeks. And he gets his walker and he goes down to the lunchroom and he tells everybody, Hey, I'm dying soon. I'm getting out of here. And he said, I'm going to heaven. And he just, and, you, and those of you that know Brother Hubbard, he, he would do this a lot, especially these last few years. He'd go, And I'm happy. <laughs> he just said, I just want you to know I'm happy. I, I'm going to heaven. I know where I'm going. We're, so, we're excited to know where he's at. But if we're excited to know where he's at, and, we, and that excites us, why wouldn't we do more to make sure that others know when they get that news from their doctor where they're going? Giving money and an offering to missionaries doesn't mean we have a burden for souls. When we have a burden to reach others, we're not going to be satisfied with just writing a check to send the missionary, we'll want to talk to others about Christ ourselves. We'll desire to see people get saved before it's too late. And then we'll have a desire to disciple them so that they can then in turn go out and reach others as well. And look, people, we would amen and say, we don't believe in this false doctrine of Calvinism that God one day before the foundation of the world said, look, these people I'm going to save and these have no, cho- no choices and they cannot get saved. We would say, don't, we don't believe that, but we're practical Calvinists in that we believe, hey, if they're going to get saved, they're going to get saved, so I don't need to go tell them. 
So in practicality, we become Calvinists and we say, well, I mean, if they're going to hear, I hope somebody tells them. How are they going to hear unless people who know the gospel speak up and tell them? John chapter 4, verse 35 says, Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. When people will say sometimes, Lord, uh, you know, if I encounter a lost person, help me be a witness. If you encounter them, walk out the front door of your house. You will encounter lost people. They are everywhere. Many of them have government jobs, okay? They, they, we have political leaders that we yell about, but let's get the gospel to them. We have people that are, we work for and work with that are lost. And instead of yelling at them, we need to give the gospel to them. Jesus spoke those words immediately after his interaction with the woman at the well. You see, we are the lifeline to those who are dying in sin. And if we lose that burden... We are on our way to becoming a dead church. We can sing all the songs. We can have preaching. We can have the right Bible and be dead. Many funerals I go to, people will like to have their Bible laid across the chest of the person that's being buried. They have the right Bible, but they're dead. The Bible ain't doing them any good at that moment. They're now face to face with the Lord. Can I tell you, for our church, we can have the right Bible and still be dead. We can have the right music and still be dead. We can be dressed right and still be dead. Those are not the vital signs of a church, but a burden for the lost is. Look over in Psalm 119, we'll see another thing that can harm our, our ability to stay alive as a church. In Psalm chapter number 119... When people lose their hunger for the Word of God, it's a sign that something's wrong. There's a health problem spiritually for them in their life. When we can watch eight seasons of a show on Netflix in the course of a week, but can't read our Bibles because we don't have enough time, there's something wrong. When we can spend hours on Facebook but can't get into this book, something's wrong. When we can stay up, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of it last night. I, I, stayed up for, I, I stayed in front of my TV for four straight hours watching Kentucky smack Florida around, and I loved every minute of it. It was great. But how many times do we sit down to read our Bible, and after 15 minutes we say... How long has it been now? I got things I need to do. I got things I need to do. We, we've got to beg the Lord to give us a hunger for His Word if we don't have that sense in our life. Here in Psalm 119, down in verse 103, he says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, and su yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I know I I'm not the greatest preacher. Some of you are like, hey, you finally got the memo. I, I know. I'm, I'm not a, a great orator. I don't have to be a great orator. All I have to do is be faithful to give you God's word. Because any speaking skills that a preacher has won't really do a lot for you. But the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is only through the Word of God that God chooses to work. Yet some are looking for someone or something that will tickle their ears, make them feel good about themselves, entertain them, have enough, enough jokes in the message, enough great stories, but they don't have a hunger for the Word of God. No longer hungering for the word of God reflects a dying people and a dying church. A lost man has no desire to hear the word of God because he cannot understand it. The worldly Christian has no desire to hear the word of God because their cares of this world get in the way. So what does it say that many churches 
are no longer emphasizing the preaching of God's word. It, it no longer has the preeminence. There are many churches, if you'll you know, watch online or something, it'll be you know, 50 minutes to an hour of music followed by a five-minute devotion, and we'll call that church. And we say, hey, well, the church is the assembly. Yes, the assembly to hear the word of God preached. Man, I, I love good music. I love fellowship. I love to gather around after church and eat. I love our ice cream days on the first Sunday of every month where we celebrate birthdays. I love all those things. But without the Word of God, we might as well shut the door. And just because the Word of God is preached doesn't mean the church will continue to be alive. Why? Because being preached from the pulpit is only part of the equation. There's those that are hearing the Word of God and having that hunger and desire for it. We say, well, if I'm at church, we must have that hunger. Well, I don't know. If we're at church and we spend more time on our phone than listening to the Word of God, there might be a, a hunger issue on the Word of God. If we're at church and all we can think about is what we're going to eat after church or where we're going to go or what we're going to do or uh, when the pastor is going to finally be quiet and let my people go. You know, we're just, we think, when are we going to get out of this place? I remember years ago, and I always, this has always stuck in my head, little Dwayne that uh, rode on our, our bus years ago that uh, broke free from junior church and uh, suddenly came down the middle aisle of our sanctuary. He was a bus kid. He didn't know anybody in that room that morning except the person who had picked him up on the bus. And uh, as he's walking down, he came can't find that person and so he's just looking around and then he gets two-thirds of the way up and he just turns in real loud just says when's this thing going to be over <laughs> and everybody laughed and and some were like oh no let's get him out of here and I said don't laugh at him he just said what a bunch of you were thinking <laughs> he was just bold enough to say it you know there, being in church doesn't mean we have a hunger for the word of God sometimes it means we have a desire to be around other people we don't want to be home alone, so we just go to church. That's just what we do. We're Christians. It's, it's Sunday. It's time to go to church. Instead of truly having a desire to come and hear the Word of God preached. And I praise the Lord for people that will text me during the week and say, Hey, I, I was reading this verse here and had a question about this. Or can you help me understand this? And they're, they're, they're desiring to hear the Word of God and read the Word of God during the week. Not just when they're at church. Another issue that comes up is a verse, and you can turn there. I know many of you know this verse, but Hebrews chapter 10, of how we'll know that we might have a church name and we might have the doors open, but it's dying is when we have no desire to assemble together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I wouldn't ask you to raise your hand on this, but how many of you think we're getting close to the Lord coming back? Okay, so we see the day approaching. But yet we assemble less and less. Even if we have scheduled assembly, they're attended less and less. Well, I'm afraid of COVID only on Sunday. COVID travels better on Sundays, don't you know, Pastor? Pastor? And since you always keep the air conditioner on in here, it blows it around everywhere. That's what you do. You all come in, you're cold. That's, that's why we're doing it. We're just blowing COVID everywhere to you, I'm sure. You know, we, our world, people tell me all the time, oh, I'm just really worried about COVID. But then they're everywhere. But the assembly is just not that important to them. We are a church family. We're family, even if we're a dysfunctional family sometimes. Dysfunctional is a fancy word for something that doesn't work properly. The local church is a family, but sometimes we don't act like it. Sometimes we don't act like it. I, I imagine that if, uh, you know, for a week straight, if when I was a kid, if my mom said, hey, it's dinner time, and for a week straight I never showed up at the dinner table... When I was a kid, my mom used to say, she made the mistake of saying this in front of me one time. She said, I know when Michael's sick and isn't going go to like, be able to go to school because he doesn't eat. Because I like to eat, if you don't know. And so she'd say, she said, if he doesn't eat, I know he's actually sick. And I overheard her say that. So I knew I just got to fast for one meal 
and I can miss school the next day. And so I would just say, I, I'm, I just don't feel like eating tonight. It would always be like when we had sauerkraut, um, you know, certain meals. I'd be like, I, I'm just kind of sick. Free day tomorrow. But if it was like a week or two and I never showed up at the dinner table, I think my family would say, maybe we ought to check on that guy. <laughs> Either he's hoarding food in his room or, or something's wrong. But yet, some of our family doesn't come to the table. Who checks on them? Well, that's the pastor's job. And guess what? When I check on people, you know what they think? Well, yeah, but that's your job. You're the pastor. You're supposed to do that. But many times they will tell me, no one else has even asked. And this is what I try to tell them many times. I have 10 texts and five calls from people who have asked me, hey, how's this person doing? They're asking, they're just not asking the right person. They'll say, well, they've asked you, but they haven't asked me. How come they haven't called me? How come they haven't reached out to me? We're a church family. I understand, we, we understand biblically that a church is led by a pastor and deacons who serve in the church. But that's not, that doesn't absolve all of us from being a part of that. I remember when I was 15 years old, I had a really bad accident. I fell and, and I'm like 40 feet and I was in the hospital and stuff. And I know many of you have heard that story, so I won't, I won't go into all that right now. But one of the most important things to me, yes, it was important to me that when I lied there in the hospital, very quickly, Brother Sheffield walked in the door. But you know what really meant a lot to me that day? was when Brother and Miss Bryant came in the door. That's what really meant a lot to me. It wasn't the pastor. It was somebody else in the church who said, hey, he's in the hospital. We're going to go over there and visit him. Now, it scared me a little bit because their daughter Rachel walked in and I was green and she was like, yep, I can't even look, I'm going to throw up. And she walked out and I was like, I haven't seen a mirror in a few days. This must be pretty bad. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, them walking in that room there at Cosair Children's Hospital. And just seeing that somebody in the church, as a teenager, who just rode in with the Hensons every week, but someone else in the church cared enough to check in on me. That meant a lot to me. They didn't say, hey, uh, we're your church family, so we'll assemble with you on Sunday. I hope you're there. Oh, in the hospital? Okay, we'll give you one week off. No, they said, we will, we will fellowship with you. We will come to you even. That's what a family does. Some family members are selfish. Some are immature. Some act like they don't have a clue what being a part of a family means. But guess what? They're still family. Do I always like and agree with everything my sisters do? Absolutely not. But they're still family. They're still my family. As a kid, and I know many of you were like this, I would say all kinds of mean things about my sisters. But nobody else was allowed to. Even if they just quoted me. It was like, let me say it. You don't say it. As, as a church family, I wish we had just a little bit of that same patience with our church family that we have with our own blood family. Those things are no excuse to forsake the family. When members of the local church begin to determine to, or to be, to be, when they become determined to forsake the assembly, it reflects an impending death. And then lastly this morning, when there's no willingness to serve with sacrifice. Anyone can serve when it comes with applause. Anyone can serve when it comes with a paycheck or can serve when it comes with honor and recognition. But when we have no willingness to serve with sacrifice, that's impending trouble. Look at Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 
Again, I know this is not a, a new verse for many of you, but sometimes we just need reminded. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You ever stop to think that what we magnify as like the uber Christian, like super Christian, is what the Bible describes as normal Christian? Man, they, they walk by faith, they, they pray, they witness, they give, they serve. What the Bible says we're supposed to do. But that's so rare that it has become the magnified thing. That that's what the super Christians do. When it should just be what every Christian does. A sacrifice had no personal rights. A sacrifice was in, in total control, you know, being totally controlled by another. Paul tells us here that we are to be the sacrifice and God is the one in control. What did I say, Isaiah say? Here am I, Lord, send me. Can we honestly say we're willing to obey Romans chapter 12, verse 1? Honestly, I, I, I would even say sometimes it's easier to say, Lord, I'd rather be a dead sacrifice. Just take me to heaven. Far better to be with him than here. But God has called us to be here, and so while we're here, we're supposed to be a living sacrifice that says, God, you purchased me. You own me. You tell me what to do, and I'll do it. When you think about the word service, what does that mean? Well, it means to work. The biblical picture time and time again is one of the master and the servant. Are we willing to work for God? What I can't find in Scripture is where God says, serving me will be easy. Serving me will always be financially profitable to you. Serving me will always mean you'll have great health. I don't see those things in Scripture. In fact, I see Lazarus dying at the gate of the rich man where the dogs are licking up his sores. But yet he followed the Lord. Are we willing to serve him, sacrifice, work for him? Luke chapter 23 or 9 and verse 23 says, He said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What service are you actively involved in? I believe every member of the church ought to be a minister in the church. Minister simply means servant. When Paul used the word minister, he, it was a, a Greek word that meant the lower rower on a ship. The worst job on the ship is the lower rower. And Paul said, but if I'm on the Lord's ship, just let me be the lower rower. Let me be, we, we say minister and we say, man, that's an elevated position. No, we're a servant. But all Christians are called to be servants. It's just where does he place us as his servant? So yeah, we might be the person who's teaching a Sunday school class or preaching or going to a foreign mission field and, and starting a church, but it, it may not be any of those things, but God has a place of service for every person he saves. I forgot last week to put out the, the sign-up sheets for the preacher's meeting for the lunches, and some of you let me know that I forgot to, to put those out because you were, you were ready. You, you, you wanted to sign up to help with that. And the statement was made to me, hey, we, we can't, you know, if we, if we want to serve, you've got to make it available to us and give us the opportunity. And I, I appreciate that mindset. And sometimes it can be easy as a pastor to just say, I'll, I'll just do this, I'll do this, I'll, I'll do those things. The other day, I, uh, and I don't mean putting anybody on the spot, but I, the other day I tried to come up here and, and do some, some yard work here at the church, and I just realized, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do this. I just don't have time. And I appreciate Brother Timberlake coming over here and, and uh, weed eating around the, um, all those poles and all those things. Those things are a maze to try to get around with the lawnmower and stuff. So you pretty much can only weed eat around those things and coming up and doing those things. And somebody might say, well, weed eating, like, what is that? Let me ask you, what are you doing for the Lord? 
What are you doing for the Lord? Guess what? Guess how much we paid Brother Timberlake for that? Zero. So if you want to get double his pay, we'll do that. I, I, I teach pre-algebra. I know what double zero is. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay that. He didn't get anything out of that. He didn't know I was going to say anything about it today. It wasn't about that. It was here's something that needs to be done. I have the ability and the availability to do it. I'll do it. But shouldn't that just be all of us? I'm not saying everybody come up here and weed eat, so please don't come here tomorrow and have 50 guys out here weed eating at the church. But if there's things that need to be done, instead of saying, well, I'm just going to set this one out. And, here, and I'll be honest with you, here's one of the main reasons I hate even talking about service in the church. Because the same people who always serve go, yeah, I need to do more. I don't, nobody should have to do everything. Nobody here should be burned out. We have enough people that if everybody would do something, nobody would be burned out. We have the people here to do what God has called us to do. But we can't make anybody do it. We, we, you know, this is all volunteer ministry here that you guys are. And I, man, I am so appreciative of this. I had a, some pastors ask me this week, we were talking about my schedule and they were asking me how it was going working at the school. And they said, you know, how do you manage these things? And I, so I started telling them about the church and I told them about, they asked me about the size of the church and what kind of ministries we had here. And they said, well, how many, how many guys on staff do you have that work with you? And I said, we don't have any, any other staff. And several of them were like, how in the world do you do that? And I said, you just got to know our church people. We've got some awesome church people here that jump in and do things. I said, I've got nine great deacons who uh, take things on their shoulders and do things and help with these things. And, and they're doing different things where I don't have to, I don't have to do all those things. And, and many of them said, I don't know what that's like. And I say that to say as a compliment to our church that, yes, it has made it very easy to have two pastors in 50 years because it has been a serving church. But I also wonder, what could we do if we got 100% participation on those things? Because there are some of you that if I start to say, hey, this is so-and-so in our church and this is what they do, it's like reading off someone's rap sheet. I mean, it's like one thing after another. They're just doing so much. They work in this ministry, and that every hour, every, every service that's going on, it seems like they're working in some ministry. They're either at the door, on the bus, in the junior church, or in a Sunday school hour. They're doing this, and they're doing that, and they're doing all these different things. How would we introduce you? Well, their, their pew stays good and warm. Or, I don't know, some, when they come. I don't say that to shame you. I say that to say God wants... You don't know what you're missing if you're not serving God. It's the greatest joy you could ever have to serve God. And we get to serve God together. And God is the prize. It's, it's not that I get a prize and uh, I, I get some award and I get a medal to put around my neck or something like that. The reward is I get to draw nigh to God by doing what he's told me to do. So what do we do? Well, let's go back to our verse that we opened with, and we'll read a few verses after that where he gave them some instruction. This church who was one that had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. The end of verse 1, he says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. He says here to strengthen the things which remain. So many times in church history where churches have died, there was a time where there were some things that still remained that they needed to stop and strengthen those things. And many of them probably thought somebody should do that. Somebody should do that. 
We've got to strengthen the things that remain. We've got to remember what we've heard and received. Hold fast to those things. And many of us would say, yes, we need to do all those things. And the one we skip. And we think, yes, the pastor in the church needs to do this. But think about this as the people of the church. He says, and repent. Repentance is that change of mind that results in a change of action. We have to determine, where are we on these things? Where's us when it comes to the burden for lost people? Where are we at when it comes to the hunger for the Word of God? Where are we at in our areas of service for the Lord? And where are we at in our assembly with the believers? And we need to repent and turn it around. We've lost our burden, repent. Lost your hunger for the Word of God, Repent forsaken your church family, and that doesn't mean you didn't, oh, I didn't have perfect attendance. I guess I've, I, I, I've failed at that. No, but when you, when you forsake the assembling with believers, it doesn't mean you missed one time. But if you've forsaken it, repent. If you have, think, uh, have thought and made the decision that watching us through a computer screen is a viable option moving forward, Repent. The church is to assemble together. It is not for consumers. I'm glad we have live stream. When someone is sick, please stay home. We don't give out perfect attendance awards because I don't want you to come when you're sick and and spread it to all of us. Please stay home when you're sick. But if you're not sick or providentially hindered, be at church. Not because we get to brag on how many we had here, but it's helpful to you to be in the, the, the assembly with believers and to hear the word of God preached. And then when you're here, serve. Find something to do. I, yesterday, I'm hesitant to share this because I don't want it to come across the wrong way, but yesterday I was frustrated at home. Because as parents, I think most of you parents will understand this. Sometimes we try our best to work hard. And sometimes it's like you have to get that point, and I'm bad about this, where it's easier for me to do it than to have my kids do it and me not like the way it's done or to have to redo it. or to take. and, And sometimes I'm guilty of just saying, I'll just do it. And mowing the grass is one of those things. I, I like mowing the grass. That's part of it. I always enjoy it. But there are times where I'm really busy and I really, there, I, I think, I wish one of my kids would say, hey, it's a jungle out there. Not, not the song, my backyard. And maybe I'll grab the mower and mow. And I thought, you know, you sit there and you start getting frustrated and you're like, yeah, they're not they're thinking can I get the controller but then I thought I don't even know if my kids know how to operate the mower because I've I've worked and I've I've tried to work really hard on doing those things and they probably think I don't know if I should touch dad's mower because he might get mad if I mess something up and guess what I probably would I'm not saying I should I'm saying I probably would but you know, for a while there, I'm sulking, like, what's wrong with these kids? Here, what, they're playing video games, watching TV. And then when I mention maybe, I might have you guys finish up mowing, they're like, what? And in part because I've never had them do it. And it's my fault completely. And sometimes even in churches, some serve and jump in and are always quick to help with things. And others never get a chance to do it. And then we get mad that others don't jump in and do it. And sometimes it'd be better for those of you that are the ones who have a bunch of lists that I could list off of all the things you do to grab somebody who's not doing anything and say, hey, can you help me with this? I'll show you what we do. I'll show you how we do this. Because we can't get mad that people don't help if we don't give them a chance to help. I knew somebody one time that was in a ministry and they were always complaining that nobody would help. And then as soon as somebody would come to them and say, well, I'll help. Well, no. And then in their mind, they're thinking, you probably won't do it right. I'll just keep doing it. But then they would go back to complain about how nobody ever helps them. 
Brother Sheffield told me the first time that I ever tried to teach a Sunday school class, I said, Brother Sheffield, I don't know the first thing about teaching a Sunday school class. I was, I was in 12th grade. He said, I want you to teach the teen class. I'm supposed to be in the teen class. And he said, I want you to teach the teen class. I said, I don't know how to teach the teen class. He said, just start, and all the people who won't do it will come tell you how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> and that's how it is sometimes in churches. Instead of us saying, look, I'll do it and I'll help train somebody else. I can't get mad at my kids for not helping me with the mower when I've never even turned them, showed them how to turn it on. And when I say turn it on, yes, it's a battery operated. It's, I don't have to crank it or nothing. But, you know, they don't know how to use that thing. The first time I ever had Caleb mow, I remember he, it looked like a jigsaw puzzle. He just went all, and I was like, my OCD was just going crazy. I had tire tracks all over the yard and I was like, it looked like a kid coloring outside the lines. And I said, forget it, just go back in. I'll get it. And it looked really good when I was done. But he didn't learn anything. He didn't learn anything. As a church, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we've had a few funerals over the last few years. Those who used to do everything, those who used to do a lot of things, we're getting less of those people. We have to have... Some new ones come in and come alongside. And I would pray that none of you would say, oh, good, a new person. It's yours. I'm out of here. You just do it. Leave me alone. No, let's walk alongside them. Over the last five, six years, how many of our great workers here? It's, go back 10 years. Think about the ones who taught and preached and sang and worked in the fair ministry and Worked in these ministries and that ministry, and we've lost them. Either they've passed away or they've had to move away. Well, who's coming up behind them? Who's coming up behind them? I pray that we would not be like Sardis and have a name that we're alive, but actually dead. And the problem is we won't know it until it's too late if we're not careful. If we're not asking God individually, help me to be alive for you. Let's stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for your word and the warnings that it gives us. I'm thankful for our church, and I, I love our church, and I believe our church is alive. But I also know that things can change so quickly if we're not careful. Or if we're not careful. I do believe we have some here that are striving so hard to serve you. They have a burden for the lost. They have a hunger for the word of God. They're serving. They're faithful in their assembling together where I also know that some parts of the body are not as healthy as they once were. Lord, I pray you'd help us to all examine ourselves and see where we're at and ask for direction from you and then follow that direction. Or we wouldn't look to place blame on others. We would just strive to make sure that we are doing what you'd call us to do. Lord, I pray that you would work in this invitation in a way that only you can. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our uh, songbooks over to page 591. We're going to sing, Have Thine Own Way. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, the invitation is open. I know a, a message like this, people might be afraid to even... Move forward, because I don't want to admit that maybe the Lord is working on me about some of these things, but I believe it's important for us to step out by faith and acknowledge that God has spoken our heart about these things, and we're going to commit to do something for Him. And so if God's spoken in your heart, you come. If not, let's sing, Have Thine Own Way this morning on that first verse. <laughs> 